Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Nimzo Indian Defense Queen B3 Variation. This variation arises from the move order d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and bishop b4. This is the starter position of the Nimzo Indian, followed by queen b3. This is a very similar move to queen c2. Queen c2 is considered to be the superior move. That is why queen b3 is considered very much a sideline. So queen b3 aims to take away at this bishop, but also sets up the move a3 so that if we are to capture this knight, the queen can simply recapture the knight without ruining white's pawn structure. So after queen b3, we have to respond to this threat immediately. The One of the few downsides of queen b3 in comparison to queen c2 is that queen c2 sets up the move e4. Queen b3 does not. And also, if we are to keep the bishop on this b4 square this queen is very limited in its mobility so it has very few squares that it can go to and it's actually in a pretty bad position so our move here is simply c5 we're going to try to keep this bishop on b4 and we don't want to start with knight c6 right away because in every single d4 opening we pretty much want to play c5 and so if we obstruct the c pawn by playing knight c6 in front of it we're never going to be able to do that that's not going to be very good for us therefore we should start with c5 now, 99% of the time, people are going to take the spawn. This is the main move. However, sometimes you might face something weird like a3, for example, in which case you can take this knight, queen recaptures, take the spawn, queen captures again, and you play knight c6. And in this position, you're definitely better. Knight c6 just attacks the queen, and you're developing at the expense of your opponent. So throughout this whole opening, you're already ready to castle. Both of your knights are out. You've traded off a bishop. And for white, the only developed piece is the queen. This king still has a while to go before it can actually castle. And I say this is a much better position for black than it is for white. And the engine agrees. So 99% of the time, you're not going to face that. You're going to face d takes c5. Now, besides d takes c5 uh, and knight c6, which is our main move, there is also the opportunity for your opponent to play knight f3 right away. In which case, we can just play d5, putting a pawn in the center, nothing to really worry about. d takes c5 is going to happen anyway, in which case we have to play knight c6. The reason that white wants to play d takes c5 is because white wants to take this bishop, do something with it, get rid of it, because the queen on b3 is simply too weak. And so our response to d takes c5 is knight c6. Obviously, we're trying to keep this bishop here without blundering it. From this position, there's very few theory. Uh, just play in the same way that you normally would and play in the style of this line, which is something that you're going to learn how to do after we discuss the main line. So for the moment, we're temporarily uh, sacrificing a pawn. White has doubled pawns, and we're eventually going to recapture this pawn, so there's nothing to be really worried about. Knight c6, we're going to get knight f3. Here you're going to play knight e4. Point is you're attacking this knight. This knight is pinned to the king because of this bishop. We're trying to triple white's pawns and have a very good game. Bishop d2 is like the only move that white can really play, in which case we're going to take this bishop. Now we have the bishop pair, so we have the advantage in that. And then we simply capture the c5 pawn. So the material balance has been restored. But we have the bishop there in a very comfortable position, whereas white has a very bad queen and no bishop there. e3, most likely move. And we can play f5. So I'm going to show you guys a game because there isn't that much theory in this position. I'm just going to show a game to illustrate the sort of ideas and the way you should be playing this line. Alternatively, if your opponent doesn't play e3, they could just play, let's say, 94 right away. In which case, you can slide this bishop back to e7. That's a very good square for the bishop because it can come out anywhere it would like to. And after something like e3, f5 here is already an option. You're going to get like knight g3 or something, and you can just castle. You're fine. Very good position for black. Now, by the way, if you've been enjoying this video so far, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps my channel out a ton, and it will help you stay notified for when future videos come out. Thank you. But obviously, after e3 and f5, this prevents any knight jump from happening. That is the main purpose of f5 itself. And it also helps us create kingside attacks in the future. Now, one could argue that f5 is a weakening move. It creates weaknesses along the light squares near the king. But to exploit that is very difficult. After we castle, how is white ever going to create an attack on our king? And the answer is, they really can't. Black has a very, very solid center. All of these pawns are strong. They're well defended. And most, if not all, of white's kind of artillery so heavy pieces all these strong pieces are located on the queen side so there's really no risk for our king to be attacked because none of the pieces are actually near our king so after we castle most likely the opponent is going to castle as well now we are following a game right now so keep in mind that your opponent might play something differently there really isn't that much theory in this position this is just to illustrate the ideas and the concepts that you should be going for in a line such as this 
We play b6. The reason we play b6 is because we need to develop this bishop somehow. I know this bishop is locked behind a grand wall of pawns, so we need to develop it through the means of Fian kettoing the bishop. We don't want to push the d-pawn and somehow try to open up this bishop because it would create a backwards pawn on e6 in a very, very vulnerable center for us. We're very much happy with the pawn structure, so we would want to place a bishop on b7 or a6, depending on the circumstances, and just work from there. a3, bishop b7, queen c2. Shuffling the piece around, white doesn't really have that much of a plan here. Now here, the player with the black pieces played rook c8. Actually, a slightly better move would have been f4. Reason being is that if this capture happened, this knight d4 jump is very strong. It forced these pieces, attacking both of them. And after queen d4, you can simply capture the spawn. And this is just a very active, very good position for black. Both of these bishops are very strong, especially the light square bishop now that it's staring into g2. There are a lot of checkmate threats here. For example, if our opponent is to play something random here like king h1, you always have even queen h4, and this is just completely winning. Uh, pretty much resignable at this point because you are going to win this game. So most likely you're going to face something different like knight to e4, from which you can take this bishop, and now you can claim that you're simply better because you have the bishop pair. Drop this bishop back to e7, and you're all good. So this is the position that you could go for. This isn't exactly the top engine choice. The engine actually really likes the move a5 here, which is odd, but not very surprising because this just prevents any advancement of this b pawn ever, thanks to these two pawns. But this is really hard to play as black and you have to be super accurate. So I'd say if you can simplify in a way that benefits you, why not do it? This is still a very good trade and you are better in this position. And so I'd say that this is a good line for black and something that you guys should consider. Now, instead of that, we got rook c8, which is fine as well. Bishop f3, just applying pressure on this knight. And now we got f4. So the f4 idea was finally spotted. And b4 is a huge mistake from white because it allows f takes e3. After these trades happen, white is simply worse. Uh, this bishop cannot stay on f3, so this pawn capture is impossible because afterwards you're going to get a sacrifice of this rook and knight e4 and this sets up knight takes f3 which would be a devastating check for the opponent obviously it's going to fork the queen and king and it's also pretty much unstoppable because you have this bishop and the knight both pointing at the pawn so there's nothing your opponent can really do you're going to give this check and now you can see the danger in that there's a discover check for black here by moving this knight since this bishop is on the same diagonal and so you're definitely going to be winning these sort of situations from here you could just play rook takes c5 uh, very calmly and you're going to be in a completely winning position so the bishop cannot stay on f3, it has to go somewhere, it might go to e4, in which case you can play knight d4. This capture is simply impossible because after king h8, uh, there's really not that much your opponent can do here. For example, if queen takes d2 in an attempt to trade these pieces off, this would be good for white. So it's important that black has a different resource, which comes in the form of this very interesting tactic of bishop takes g2, king takes g2, followed by knight f3, attacking this queen, and the queen can't really go anywhere. Let's say it goes back to c2. In this case, you have already queen g5, and this is pretty much made in two. Not pretty much, this is made in two. So obviously an excellent position for black, and white would want to avoid that at all costs. So instead of that, we got a different line. Now here, black missed an opportunity. Black took this bishop, but instead of that, black had the very nice move knight b3, which was a fork, which would have won the game on the spot. Uh, that did not occur, and instead black took the bishop, which pretty much got rid of most of black's advantage. However, black still managed to win this game. Now, we don't have to review the rest of the game, uh, as it wasn't really in the style of the Nimzo Indian. There isn't that much new to cover. But what I really wanted to illustrate is just how dangerous the position can be for white. If white isn't careful, this F4 maneuver is very strong in all these cases. And as we can see, it presents a great deal of danger for white. Now, last but not least, let's take a look at what happens if the opponent doesn't go for something like knight F3, the very standard move, and instead bins our knight. So this prevents knight e4. Obviously, that's the kind of main move that we want to play, knight e4, and take away at this knight, chip away at it, maybe take this bishop if it were to be on d2, and take away white's bishop there. This prevents that. So we're going to play h6. We don't want this bishop here. We want to kick it away. If this trade happens, we're very much fine. We take it back with the queen, and this queen is finally developed. Our king is ready to castle. Knight f3, we can take the c5 pawn e3 and the line kind of ends here after we play b6 so once again b6 is the main idea you want to play bishop b7 and just hunt down on this diagonal um, you don't want to play d5 and trade all of these pieces opening up the center because right now you are better in the fact that your pawn structure is very solid and white spawn structure is kind of messed up this queen is very passive so if we were to open up the center somehow 
this would not be advantageous for us because white's queen would get more active white would be able to develop pieces easier and we would lose this very nice center so instead of that bishop b7 is a great option we can castle kingside white can castle pretty much anywhere it doesn't really matter our plans are going to be very simple with bishop b7 just working against this diagonal maybe taking this knight and winning a pawn if possible and if not we're going to have the advantage in the fact that we have the bishop pair we can always play something like 95. now guys this was a somewhat shorter video the reason for that is that there really isn't that much more to cover there's very little theory in this position this has not been practiced this isn't employed very regularly by strong players simply because it is inferior However, it is important to know how to play against this. And so the tools that I've provided in this video should be more than enough for you guys to go out there and win any game in this variation that you face. With all that being said, this summarizes everything I wanted to show you guys in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider checking out a video to my left. As always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in a future video.